a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Forces Radio Service. Tonight we present The Resurrection. The second of two Holy Week dramas based on events in the greatest life ever lived. A bare hill against a gray sky, and three crosses stood on the hill. To the left, a thief, and to the right, another thief, and between them, the Son of God, who drank of the cup of his Father's will. And far off to his followers, who had scattered at the first blow. I should have stood up for him, John. Fought them. Done what I could to save him. He was not to be saved, Peter. The suffering, the insults, the scourging. Perhaps it could have all been avoided if I were braver. He was brave. For he chose not to avoid it. You, Thomas, your face is like a mask. You've said little, shown little. Why? I'm waiting, Peter. Waiting? What is there left now? Do you think I have no heart, no feeling for my fellow men? Can I bear to see anyone suffer so? And most of all, him? But to me, feelings are not enough. I must know. Look to the top of the hill. That's enough to know. I look to the top of the hill and beyond it. Three days beyond it. For didn't he say in three days he would rise? When you look back over what happened in the last day alone, three days are eternity. I must wait and see. I must know this thing with my own eyes, my own mind. Else everything I believe will crumble and be nothing, and I shall be an empty man the rest of my days. I've never believed anything easily. I've questioned and pondered and then believed. If this is not so, I shall never believe in anything again. Come. I can't bear to look anymore. Come, Mary. From Magdala, I followed him. Then from Galilee, here. Now I would follow him even beyond here. Please, Mary. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I heard him say it. His forgiveness, even in the moment of his great suffering. You there. What would you want with us? I must talk to you. We're peaceful people. So exercise your authority elsewhere. Please, friend. Friend? Yes. Who are you? Joseph is my name. I am from Arimathea. I'm your friend, as I was his friend. You're... You're of the council. Did you vote against him, too? No, friend. And now I come with an offer of friendship. Does he have a place to lie? Once she said, even the beast had caves. The son of man had no place to rest his head. There is a place. A newly dug tomb in solid rock in a garden of sweet grasses and fine flowers. And no one lies there. 
nor will anyone, if you give me the word that he will lie there. We give the word. What word are we? Dare we even claim him now? We're cowards. And worse, then I'll claim him. You know the danger? Yes. But the place I had prepared for myself, it shall be his. I'll go to Pilate now to ask. Who goes there? What do you want? I am Joseph of Arimathea. I've come to see his excellency, Pontius Pilate. He's in no mood for seeing people today, I can tell you that. It must be today. It must be at once. It'll go worse for you if he finds out you insisted. You may tell him I insisted. Well, you're the one who'll take the risk, not me. Anthony. Yes, sir. Watch this one. I'll go and see. Ah, right, sir. Plenty of excitement yesterday, wasn't there? I said there was plenty of excitement. Yes. Yes, there was. Of course, me and my bad luck, I missed the part where they dressed him like a king. <laughs> Imagine pretending to be a king to us Romans. We know more about kings than anyone. I heard they made a crown of thorns and dressed him in purple robes. <laughs> that must have been fun. You don't seem very happy today, do you? May God have mercy on you. Thank you, Sam. You know, my luck's been all bad the last few weeks. Why, when we cast lunch for his coat, I lost. Maybe that's what I need, a little mercy or luck or something. Please. Don't go on that way. All right, what's the matter with you? I think you're... Hello, I'll have a see you. This way. His Excellency will see you after all. Thank you. You better mind your tongue when you talk to his excellency. It's this door. I'll open it for you. Uh, in here. You wanted to see me? Excellency. Come here. Come close. Well, what do you want? What's so important that it brings you here now? Excellency... It's a small matter to you, but it's important to me. The usual introduction to a favor. Well, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. I... Sir, how can I tell you without speaking? I wish I'd never heard of him. What's he done to you? What's he done? He's come into my life in so many ways. Two days ago, he was only a bit of gossip. And I can and preacher to whom some ascribed wonderful powers. But with all the man, I didn't have to worry about. He even served a purpose. Kept the people's minds off other things. And then they brought him here. And the way he looked at me. His eyes. I won't forget them. There'll be so many who won't forget. But it wasn't that alone. He's even reached in to disrupt my home. My own wife won't talk to me. First she kept prattling about a dream concerning the man. She warned me not to have anything to do with him. Now, now she stays alone in her room and cries and won't talk to me at all. I wish I'd never heard of him. I'm sorry I can't promise you'll never hear of him again. Why do you say that? We shall never cease to hear of him. Is that what brought you here? To make threats and give me warnings? No, Excellency. I've come with a simple request. His body... I ask for that. His body. Why? Isn't he entitled to burial? But uh, why you? It's easy to see from your clothes. You're a wealthy man. An important man. What did you want with him? You're thinking he was friend only to the poor and downtrodden. But what he taught was for the poor and rich alike. I count myself among his followers. Huh. And if I give you the body... He shall be buried according to our custom. And that's all? For my part, I promise. That's all. Well, take it. Take it.
hit and I don't ever want to hear of the man again. Perhaps out of sight, out of mind. Bury him. And if you can, bury every memory of it. I promise only to bury the body excellently. <laughs> Here again. I didn't send for you. Excellency, I couldn't believe what I heard. I don't know what you mean. I'm so disappointed in you. What? Is it true that you gave permission to have him buried? Yes. The last and the least thing any man is entitled to is a decent burial. And so you handed over the body. See, here. You're forgetting your place. You no right to cross-examine me. Just handed over the body. That's all it meant to you. I'm through with this thing, I tell you. I thought I heard the last of it when I let them take away the body. Now you're here, hounding me again. Is there no escaping that man? Oh, there was a way, but you had to blunder. I will not allow you to talk to me that way. Didn't you know? No, what? The prophecy he'd made. This is a land full of prophecies. One tires of hearing them. Well, what did he say? That after he was dead three days, he'd rise again. That's fantastic. Utterly impossible. You know that. Well, you know it and I know it, but if his followers were to take the body away and hide it and then claim that he's risen, who could say no? You... you mean they believe it? Well, of course they would, and the only proof that we'd ever have is the body itself. And you gave that away. Well, that... I didn't know why. Well, what can we do now? Well, only one thing. Make sure the body is sealed up in the tomb for at least three days. After that, nothing matters. Well... You have guards. Post them. Make sure the body remains. Do anything. Only get me out of this. I... I don't understand it. And I'm afraid. Yes, afraid. So do what needs doing and leave me alone. <laughs> Near this tomb. 
Understand? Aye, right, sir. And are you there? Aye, right, sir. You still want to go? No, sir. Just to say I volunteered, sir. Yeah. All you others. All right. Uh, hey. That takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? I'll win a commendation for that, I will. Sure, it's all to guard you. Yeah, might as well. Well, you can pace up and back and find military money. Not me. Guarding a tomb. I'll be the laughing stock of the company, I will. <laughs> Shouldn't hurt. 
Start to see. Wait. Something here. I can feel it. Men. The shroud, but empty. He's gone. Gone. Dad, did you hear me? Gone. Only an empty shroud. Yes. We must tell the others. Come, quickly. Come. Come. Yes, Mary, come with us. We're going to tell the others. No, John. But why? I shall wait here. There may be danger. I don't care. I shall wait here. Alone. Take care, Mary. Con. Con. I must see for myself. So dark in here. So dark. Who are you? Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Please, if you tend the garden here, tell me, have you removed him from here? If so, tell me where and I will take him away. Mary. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. I see 
the nail wounds in his hand, the place where the spear was thrust into his thigh. Not to then will I believe. Master. 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 It is you. Peace be with you. Master. You know me well. I am Thomas. And being Thomas, I doubt. I must have proof before I believe. Thomas, reach out thy fingers and behold my wounds. Yes, Master. The wounds where the nails were driven. And bring hither thy hand and put it into my side. Here, the spear struck. Oh, Master, Master. And be not faithless, but believing. My Lord and my God. Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Go you, therefore, and teach all the nations to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The Franciscan Friars of the Atonement present the Ave Maria Hour.
Hello, this is Father Bob Warren of the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. Thank you for listening to this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour radio show. The Friars' popular Ave Maria Hour was first brought to the radio airwaves in 1939, recorded in New York City and on the mountainside grounds at Grimoire, a home in Garrison, New York. These timeless classic stories of the Bible and the lives of the saints came to life each week through dramatic reenactment by professional actors and actresses. You know, friends, Christ once said, Do not hide your treasure under a bushel. In saying this, he meant, Share your gifts, share your talents. The Friars of the Atonement feel the message in these broadcasts remains as powerful and timely as when they were originally aired, and we are so happy to be able to share them with you today. To learn more about the missions and ministries of the Friars of the Atonement, I invite you to visit our website, www.atonementfriars.org. In the meantime, sit back and enjoy this rebroadcast of the Ave Maria Hour. The Sixth Station of the Cross Slowly, the people in the cathedral turn from the base relief portrayal of the scowling and reluctant Simon helping Jesus carry his cross. And they move on to the next station. A woman kneels before Jesus. She is looking up into his face, and her hands hold a white cloth on which is embedded the exact image of Jesus' face, disfigured by wounds and blood and dust and spittle. We adore thee, O Christ, and we bless thee, because Because by thy thy holy cross cross, thou hast redeemed the world. Consider how the holy woman Veronica, seeing Jesus so afflicted and his face bathed in sweat and blood, presented him with a towel with which he wiped his adorable face, leaving on it the impression of his holy countenance. Alas, my my soul also was once beautiful, but I have disfigured it since by my sins. Thou alone, alone, my Redeemer, Redeemer, canst restore it to its former beauty. When Marcus, the centurion, saw a woman struggling through the crowd, he did not recognize her because of the veil about her head. But when she took it off, he saw it was Veronica, his wife, and he ordered her not to come to Jesus. But she heeded him not, and she fell on her knees in Jesus' path. And when he reached her, she held up the veil so that he could use it as a towel to wipe the blood and dirt from his eyes and face. For he had great trouble in seeing. When Marcus saw her intent, he was angered, for he remembered the veil, and it galled him to see it regarded as nothing more than a towel. No, no, old woman, I don't like that veil. The Roman centurion is hard to please. I want a suitable present for a woman. Ah, your lover, perhaps. No, my wife. She is beautiful, and the gift must be beautiful. Forgive me, soldier. Most of the men who buy from me are not thinking of... How much is that one? This? Uh, No, 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 the second one to the right of it. Ah, what taste, what judgment you have. I must confess you fooled me. Well, what do you mean by that? When I see you coming along, looking in the shops, I say to myself, Ah, here's a soldier. He knows nothing about value. I'll get rid of slow-selling cloth. How was I to know you had such fine taste? How much for the veil? Only a discerning man would have selected that veil out of the many I have. Oh, come, come, woman. I haven't all day. How much? Only a sharp eye could have looked over my stock and found the most exquisite, expensive veil in the shop. 
Oh, but I hesitate to take it down. Perhaps it's too much for your pocketbook. Uh, let me be the judge of that. How much? Thirty denarii. Thirty denarii? As I thought, it's too expensive, even for a beautiful wife. Here is one. Very fine quality for only ten denarii. And this one, it has a slight flaw. I could let you have it for eight. The flaw's at the corner and no one would ever know. I'm not in the habit of buying damaged cloth for my wife. Of course. Please forgive me. Let me look about. I'm sure I have something to suit your purse. Uh, let me see the veil, the one for thirty denarii. Here. Hmm. What makes this cost so much more than the others? It's plain white, no decoration. It's from India, the finest, softest cloth made by the women who spend most of their time weaving cloth for the priests. How do you get this kind of merchandise? Three times a year I go to Damascus to buy goods for my shop, cheaper goods for the most part, but now and then I find something exceptional for the few rich patrons I have. From India, you say? Yes. That's one reason it's expensive. The transportation runs high. Then, of course, I have to charge for my trips to and from Damascus. You may be sure that when your wife puts on this veil, few, if any other woman, will have one like it. And I'm sure your wife is a person of taste, like yourself. Certainly. And she does not like then to wear something every other woman would be wearing. Ah, feel the texture. It's very soft. Still, I don't see why it sells for so much more than those with decorations. Ah, so many of my customers make that mistake. What's plain has to be without flaw. With decorations, they can be hidden. But since this is beyond your reach, let me look for something cheaper for your wife. What's her name, by the way? Uh, Veronica. What a lovely name. Have you been married long? Only five years. Have you children? No. Oh, that's too bad. Well, my wife is not well. She, she's she been ill for a long time. I'm so sorry to hear that. Then you must take time and find something special for her. Something that will make her realize what a considerate husband she has. And I'll take this veil. Oh, good, good. It's the only one of its kind. And I'm so glad you've taken it. For you, I'll put it in a special container. Here you are. Oh, that will be 30 denarii and five shekels. The temple tax. Thank you. Thank you a thousand times. And may God's blessing go with you to your beautiful wife. Abner, I've just sold the white veil. Open the chest and get another. <laughs> 30 denarii, Abner, <laughs> for a veil worth ten. <laughs> Veronica? Marcus, in the garden. Veronica. Oh, it's good to be home again. Oh, how I've missed you. You must be tired. But I really didn't expect you until tomorrow. Well, I came from Tarsus to Joppe by ship, then rode to the night to get here. Oh, Marcus, you did this for me. Well, I don't report to pilot until tomorrow. I rode so we could have a free day all to ourselves. Well, then I'll not scold you for arriving covered with dust. I'll have the servants prepare a bath and an early supper. Now, later, later, Veronica. Tell me, how have you been? Oh, just the same, Marcus. You look stronger. <laughs> this is one of my good days. I even took a walk and visited some of the shops. Ah, good. I'm glad when you move about. Three whole hours today. Then I got a bit tired and came home and rested here. Did you have the doctor, as I told you? Almost daily. What does he say? No, the same. I must get plenty of rest and not overtax myself. But no more about my health. How was your trip? Routine, Veronica. We rounded up the leaders of the revolt and executed them. By crucifixion? Yes. It's a terrible way for a man to die. I wish you didn't have to take part in it. Well, it is very unpleasant, Veronica, but it's very effective in stopping others from trying to revolt. I left the cohort in charge of Valerius and hurried home. The pilot wants me on hand for the Jewish Passover. The servants tell me Jesus is here. Oh. Then Pilate will need me. No telling what will happen when he comes to the city. Veronica, close your eyes. Closed. You brought me a present? Mm hmm From Tarsus. 
I had a whole day waiting for the ship to sail, and I visited the shop. Oh, what is it? Can I look? Here, feel it. Oh, it's cloth. Oh, how soft. Now you can look. A veil. Oh, Marcus, it's beautiful. Where did you find it? An old woman's shop in Tarsus. It came from India. India? Are you sure? I, I mean, you shouldn't have been so extravagant. But you do like it. Oh, it's beautiful. And I'll wear it whenever I go out. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> Oh, I do hope life wasn't too lonely for you while I was away. Well, our friends have been kind and called often to ask how I was, and about you, and to leave fruit and presents. I read a lot and slept, and I did a lot of thinking. Oh? Thinking about what? Marcus, remember the servant girl we had, Hester? Um, yes, the one you liked so much but suddenly disappeared one day. Why, what about her? She visited me one day. She wants to come back to us? I wouldn't risk it, Veronica. No, she doesn't want to come back. Well, what did she want? She said she knew someone who could help me. A new doctor? No. She told me why she left so suddenly. You recall she didn't even ask for her wages. She left us to follow this man called Jesus from Nazareth. Indeed. She told me Jesus has cured many people of all kinds. Now, Veronica, I've heard these stories, too. Well, surely you're not telling me that you want to try him. Oh, Marcus, now please listen and let me finish. Mm, very well, then. Some months ago, Jesus came to Capernaum. And Hester was there, and she saw this actually happen, so it's not just hearsay. Oh, yes, yes. Now, what happened? There was a leader of the synagogue who came to Jesus and asked him to come and save his young daughter who was dying. Are you going to tell me he cured her? No, Marcus. Jesus was on his way. But suddenly he stopped and said, Who touched me? Finally a woman came forward and confessed that she had touched the tassel of his cloak. So? Now what's the point of all this? The woman said she thought if she could but touch him, she would be cured. And Jesus said to her, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace, and be thou healed of thy affliction. Oh, Veronica, you can't put any faith in this kind of cure. Marcus, that woman was suffering from a hemorrhage for over twelve years, the same as I. Hester saw her about a week ago, and she's entirely well. Most likely she wasn't ill to start with. Hester talked to women who knew her for years, and they all said the same. The woman did suffer the illness. Marcus, I'd like to go to Jesus and ask him to cure me. No, Veronica, it's impossible. But why shouldn't I try? This woman had gone to all the doctors and they could do nothing for her. But we have nothing to do with Jesus were not of his religion. Even if he can cure, which I doubt. He wouldn't do anything for a Roman. He, like the other Jews, hates us. But how many prayers, how many sacrifices have we made to Jupiter without relief? How many doctors have we tried? What harm will it do to ask Jesus? Oh, I wish to heaven Hester hadn't told you about this cure. But why? Surely you don't want a sick wife always about? Veronica, you put me in a very difficult position. Now, how can I, loyal to Rome and our gods, tell you to go to this man? Now Hester's aroused your hopes, and if I refuse you, you'll always feel that I stood in the way of your cure. Oh, no, no, Marcus. I love you. But I want to be strong and well for your sake. I, I... Marcus, I'm afraid if I don't get well, you'll tire of me. No man can put up with a sick wife forever. Oh, Veronica. Beloved, never have such fears. You'll always be the only one in my thoughts and in my heart. But I do worry about it. I can't help it. And now that Jesus is in Jerusalem... Not that I have any faith in the man, but... Well, if there were only some way you could go secretly to him. But as the wife of a Roman centurion, don't you see, Veronica? It would be the end of my career. I'd be held responsible for your act. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking only of myself. Pilate would think you'd betrayed Rome. Why, I could explain to him. I, I could tell him I permitted it because of the stories told about Jesus' cures and... Gave way to convince you that there was no truth to them. Then 
You have no faith in him? None whatever. But Pilate is spied upon by Herod and the Jews. Once the report got back to Rome, Caesar would hold Pilate to account for our actions, and he'd have to send me back to Rome. Yes. Yes, I can see that now. My hands are tied. Unless I want to forget all about my career. Oh, no, no. I, I, I couldn't ask you to do that. So, if you can put up with me as I am, we'll go on and I'll do my best to make you happy. You have brought me much happiness. But you've missed not having children. Yes, I... I admit it. But after the first couple of years, I was resigned to it. Planned my life accordingly. Oh, if there were only some way I could hide myself in a crowd and reach out and touch him as did the woman at Capernaum. What? Veronica, do you have that much faith in the man? Yes. I have that much faith in him. Marcus, I thought Oh, stay, were... Veronica. The messenger's leaving. Tell Pilate I'll be on hand at the appointed hour. You look so troubled. Is there anything wrong? No, no. Just uh, something unexpected's come up. You're not going on duty tonight. Yes, sir. I must be at the Antonia two hours from now. One of those secret missions wives don't ask about? No, not exactly. I... I'm to take a detail of men and accompany the temple guards to preserve order in case it's necessary. You're sure it's not dangerous? No. no, no. Inconvenient, that's all. Marcus, I've known you too long not to know... Oh, no, really, there's little danger involved. Yet there's something you don't want me to know. Veronica, the high priest plans to arrest Jesus tonight. Arrest Jesus? But why? Oh, it seems he's violated one or more of their endless religious laws. But why must the Roman soldiers go along? Well, Jesus has a large following. It would be very easy to start a riot, even a revolt. What can they do to Jesus? Well, that depends on how serious the charge is. With anything deserving the death penalty, they have to get permission from the procurator to carry it out. <laughs> I doubt if it's anything that serious. Most likely some religious squabble about what they must eat and when, or whether they can lift a finger on their blessed Sabbath. I wish you didn't have to go. I'm so on edge tonight. You've been talking to Hester again? Oh, just for a few minutes this afternoon. Now, I think it would be better if you didn't see her. Well, after all, Marcus, you're not home much. I do get lonely, and she's lively and full of news. About the cures Jesus makes? Yes, among other things. You still have hopes of some miraculous cure? Yes. Oh, I know I promised to never mention it again. I've tried not to think of it, but... Marcus, there have been so many, many reports. They can't all be lies. There must be something to it. There has to be. Veronica, don't you see? It's your intense desire to be well that makes you believe this man can cure you. You've reached the point where you're clutching at straws. Oh, perhaps I am. Marcus, I'm sorry. When you're going off to duty, I shouldn't make you anxious about me. No, I, I've thought about this a good deal. As long as this man lives, you'll regret you didn't ask him to cure you. But I told you I'd try to... I know you'll try to forget all about it. But you won't. Nor shall I. There'll always be a lingering doubt and recrimination... That had you gone, you would have been cured. I wish we'd never heard of this man and his powers. Without ever knowing the man, I've come to hate him. Please, Marcus, don't say that. It's so unlike you. It isn't that the proof when I say things against my nature? Please, Marcus, go to your post. I'll go to bed and try to sleep. No, this has to be settled once and for all. Settled? I didn't know we were quarreling about something that had to be settled. Veronica, I... I want you to go to Jesus and ask him to cure you. Marcus, you know I can't do that when your career... It can be arranged. When Jesus goes back, you take Hester and go with him. 
I'll tell everyone I've sent you to the mountains to escape the heat. At some isolated spot, go to Jesus in disguise of a servant and ask for a cure. Oh, Marcus, I'd never forgive myself if anything happened to you because of me. And I would never forgive myself if there were one chance in ten thousand to make you well. And I refuse to let you take it. The garden's not far ahead. He'd better be here. But I told you he would either be at the house where he ate the Passover feast or at the Garden of Gethsemane. The feast was ended sooner than I expected. How do you know so much about his habits? That's my business. Oh, I see. How much? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. How much do they pay you for informing? I didn't inform. I rendered the nation a service. So Brutus spoke when he stabbed Caesar. Isn't it better one man die rather than the nation perish? At first thought it would seem so. Then again it depends on who the man is and what the nation is. But how can one man be right and the entire nation wrong? Quiet. The garden is just ahead. I'll get ten of my men and go on ahead. Now move quietly. How many men are there with Jesus? Twelve. I, I mean, eleven now. Well, it's dark. How we know one from the other? Whomever I kiss, that is he. Lay hold of him. Very well. All right, spread out a hand length apart and follow this man. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Judas. Judas Iscariot. Men, follow Judas. As soon as he kisses the leader, move in quickly and seize him. If the others resist, use your swords. As soon as I give the signal, the rest of you will come on the run. All right, let us go. Stand fast! No one will move! Hail, Rabbi. Seize that man! Never mind the others. We have the leader. Bind him and turn him over to the temple guards. <laughs> Esther. Esther, what's happened? Oh, stop crying and tell me. Last night they arrested Jesus. Yes, I know that. But what's happening now? Why was there so much shouting? Hasn't your husband told you? Marcus hasn't been home since last night. No one's come to me with a message. I don't know where he is, do you? Jesus has been condemned to die on the cross. Your husband is carrying out the execution orders. Oh, no, I, I can't believe it. He wouldn't. Pilate ordered it. He has to obey. When did it happen? Where is Jesus now? At the Praetorium. They put the cross on his back and will start for Golgotha. All his followers fled and he's alone. Hester, help me. I will go to him. You will go to him? Yes. Will you help me? Yes. Hand me that veil. Yes, it's best you cover your face. Your husband will be displeased should he see you. Come. Let's waste no more time. <laughs> The two women made their way from the house along the narrow streets. Hester supported her former mistress for a while, but soon she was running to keep up with her. And even in her sorrow, Hester wondered at the quick, firm stride of the invalid. Soon they reached the street and the crowds about Jesus, and they could hear a man calling out that everyone should bear witness that he helped Jesus carry the cross against his will. Let me through, please. Please make way. Stand aside. A lady wants through. I did not. You can't go any further. The soldiers... Let go my arm. 
I'm going to him. But your husband's there, and he look at him. He's trying to carry the weight, but he's blinded by blood and grime. Give me something to cleanse his face. I've nothing. The veil. I use that. Veronica, go back. Don't try to stop me. Veronica. Do you expect him to kill you before this crowd? I didn't come here for that. But to help him. And as Jesus came toward her with groping hands, she held out her veil to him. And he took it and wiped the blood from his eyes and beard so that his face was clean again. And he showed her by his eyes that he was grateful to her. Simon the Cyrene looked upon the bloodstained cloth and was ashamed that he had cried out he did not wish to help Jesus carry his cross. Now that Jesus could see, the soldiers prodded him with their spears, and he lurched forward toward Golgotha. Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the National Council of Catholic Men, presents the Catholic Hour. The Catholic Hour opens with the singing of the sequence Victime Pascale Laudes by a group of the Paulist choristers. Five sequences have been retained in the Missal occupying a very prominent position, both in the Missal and in the Library of Ecclesiastical Music. Victime Pascale Laudes, the sequence appointed for Easter, is the oldest now in use and is attributed to the first half of the 11th century. Senior Fulton J. Sheen of the Catholic University of America will now deliver the last in his series of 17 addresses on the general subject, peace. His discourse today is entitled, The Resurrection, 
I present Monsignor Sheen. Friends. Celebrating Easter in a world that is more like a Good Friday and hearing the chants of peace amidst the explosions of war makes us wonder what lesson this blessed feast could have for these tragic days. The answer is to be found in two distinct scenes in the life of our Lord. The first scene took place in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the Savior in the full majesty of his person goes out to meet the devil in the guise of Judas. He surrenders himself into the hands of Judas and the soldiers with these words. This is your hour. And the power of darkness. The important word here is hour. For apparently evil has its hour and uses it to turn out the light of the world and to deliver it over to the Stygian darkness of despair. The second scene took place earlier in the Lord's life, when the Pharisees sought to get rid of him by making him fearful of Herod, whom they said intended to kill him. The supreme value of the story is in the answer our Lord gave. In effect, he said, Go tell that fox who has a mind to kill me that he is helpless. He cannot kill me until I have done my work and I have three days' work to do. This was figurative language. Two of these days are for works of convincing men of his divinity. But the third day will be the day of mystery and perfection. The important word here is day. Put the two scenes together, and there emerges this lesson. Evil has its hour, but God has his day. And that evil hour is inseparable from God's day. One with it. Unless the seed has its hour when it falls to the ground and dies, it will never have the day when it rises forth to newness of life. Without the war with evil in its hour, there will never be the day of peace. Unless there is a Good Friday in our lives, there will never be an Easter Sunday. Unless there is the crown of thorns, there will never be the halo of light. Unless there is the scourged body, there will never be the glorified body. And there is the answer to the question of Easter. How can we celebrate Easter in a world that is like a Good Friday? By seeing in this war the operation of God's law that without this hour of suffering and sacrifice, we might never come to a national resurrection. Did we but realize it, peace is not a passive but an active condition. It is not something that is given. It is something that is achieved. Our blessed Lord never said, Blessed are the peaceful, but he did say, Blessed are the peacemakers. Peace must be made. It must be won in a battle. Good Friday was not a day of appeasement. And therefore, Easter was not a day of false peace. God hates peace in those who are destined for war. And evil has its hour, 
but God will have his day. And so much is that hour of suffering and tragedy a part of the day, that in the triumph of his resurrection, our divine Lord keeps the scars that he received in the hour of his defeat. And he keeps those scars for all eternity. And on the last day, when he shall come in the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead, he will show them as pledges of his victory. He is a prince of peace. But only because he was once a captain of oars and the lord of hosts, Soldiers wear medals for bravery, but he wears his glorious scars as radiant suns in hands and feet and feet and side, scars that he received the day that he fought in the battle for peace. The Via Crucis is the Via Pacis. The way of the cross is the way of peace. To pass through that hour of evil alone and in itself is no guarantee that we will have peace. We have to pass through that hour with him. The thief on the left on Good Friday had his hour, but it was not born in union with our divine Lord. And therefore it profited him nothing. The thief on the right, on the contrary, passed through his hour in union with Christ and therefore came to his day. And our Lord called it just that, this day, paradise. And St. Paul has said, this saying is true. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. Now apply this lesson that only those who pass through Calvary's hour with him shall ever come to the day of victory. Look out upon the nations of the world, except our own. Look at Holland, Belgium, France, Germany, Finland, Italy, Philippines, Greece, Russia, the Balkan states, Mexico, and Spain. Think of how many are suffering in these lands. And I speak only of those who are in these lands are suffering in the name of Christ. There must be hundreds of thousands of them in these lands. They are having their hour. Their hour of darkness, of famine, and of hate. Above all the battlefields of the world, beyond the din of national slogans, the scheming of foxes, the debates of politics, the selfish classes of economic forces, there is one common bond uniting them all. They are all prostrate before the cross of Christ. They have all been kissed by some Judas, smitten by some soldier, misjudged by some Caiaphas, mocked by some Herod, crucified under some Pilate. And in this their hour of darkness, they have a pledge that if the Easter law holds true, and it does, to the extent that their sufferings are one with him, they will rise again. Not because of any reshuffling of politicians or any new theory of economics will they rise. For politics again will fail. Economists again will blunder. Foxes will be caught in their own traps. Schemers will be caught in their own schemes. But because these hundreds of thousands of chosen souls have been signed with the sign of the cross and sealed with the seal of salvation... Because they have borne their cross in Christ in that hour, they will rise with Christ. This war to them is the sowing of a seed. Evil has its hour, but God will have his day.
apply this lesson now to our own country. If it be true that those who have already had their hour with Christ will have their day with him, then the inverse is true. We shall have our day of victory only on condition that we have an hour of darkness with Christ. We want victory in America. We all want it. Victory with justice. But Easter teaches us that there can be no day of victory unless we pass through the hour of struggle against evil and in union with the Savior. As our risen Lord told the disciples at Emmaus, Know you not that the Son of Man must suffer in order to enter into his glory? It is the only way we can enter into glory. And we Americans have already begun to pass into that hour, that hour of sacrifice. We've not chosen it. It has been forced upon us by our enemies. But we're in it. And like the Savior on Calvary, we are already being stripped. As he was... But we are being stripped of our rags of self-righteousness. And as we're stripped of these, we'll begin to be great. First of all, we are beginning to die to that false notion that there's no such thing as evil. How often we have said in America in our schools in the last generation, there's no distinction between right and wrong. Good and evil are only points of view. There's no absolute. But now, we're dying to that false notion. We are all pointing our fingers across the seas, to both, across both seas, and we're saying, they're evil! They're wicked! These men are devils! Well, if they're wrong, then there must be a right. And if there's a devil that wars with God, there must be a God. We're being forced onto God's side. And we're being stripped, too, of another rag. The false rag of self-expression. There are a few reactionary educators in the United States. We have not yet caught up to the tempo that wins the war. Who are still talking about self-expression. They want no discipline, no authority, no restraint. But fortunately, we're being stripped of that now by the war. And sacrifice is being imposed upon us. And now, like Nicodemus, we're beginning to see that nations like men must be reborn before they can live. And finally, we're being stripped of another rag, the rag of progress. We've been saying up to this time that progress was in an ascending straight line, that the mere fact that we lived, we got better. The blind cosmic forces were sweeping us on until we became kind of supermen. But this war reveals to us just the contrary. Namely, that no life becomes better unless it dies to a lower self. This spring which we are now enjoying is not an ascending progress from last spring. It is a result of the death of the old one. And so must all nations and civilizations die in this hour of darkness before they will come to the day of their victory. There will be an hour of humiliation. 
Of this there is no doubt. Our choice as a nation is not between being humbled and not being humbled. The choice is who shall humble us. Will it be our enemies? Or will we humble ourselves? Let me put it bluntly this way. Would we, as a defeated nation, be more moral, more just, and more Christian than we would as a victorious, revengeful nation? If we would be more moral as a defeated nation, then we may expect from God to be defeated. That is the only way that we could be bettered. We'll go down to it. But fortunately, it is not the only way. Instead of being humbled by enemies, there is another way. We can humiliate ourselves by recognizing that only by and through our share with the redemption of Christ can we pass through that hour that will bring us to the day of peace. And if, therefore, we pass through that hour in such a way that labor lifts up its hand as Christ lifted up his in the carpenter shop, in service of a father, and if capital like Joseph of Arimathea gives of its wealth for the service of Christ, if women like Magdalene will bring their spices to anoint him, if educators like Nicodemus will come in the dark to find the truth that is his, if soldiers like the one at the foot of the cross share the wine of their life with him, if we all begin to see him wounded in the wounded, hidden in the lost, destitute in the destitute, if we enter this work of sacrifice as he entered the garden, then we need never fear the outcome. Why, we've already won! Only the news has not yet leaked out. We shall have our day of victory in him if we first have our hour of darkness with him. And if there is anything that adequately describes this Easter message, it is that of the eagle. Eagles build their nest high in the mountains, generally overlooking cliffs and precipices and abysses. When finally the young are hatched, the mother eagle, in virtue of an instinct implanted in her, begins to stir in that nest and scatter the twigs that cradle the infancy of its young. It nudges one of the eaglets to the edge of the nest, and it shrinks back again in safety. But the mother bird, through the infallible urge of the Creator, finally succeeds in pushing the young over the edge of the nest. Down and down it falls, its feeble wings fluttering in vain to bear it up against what must seem to it as catastrophe and death on the rocks below. But just before the eaglet crashes in the fearful depths, the parent bird swoops under it, gathers it upon its great wings, bears it aloft into the sky, and there debarking its living cargo allows the young one to flutter again and to fall but not to death. Again the mother bird catches that cargo on its great pinions, lifts it up into the sky, and on and repeats the process until the bird has learned to fly. And Moses, looking out upon a scene of that kind in his own land, said that as the eagle stirreth the nest of its young, so does God stir up the nation. So does God stir up the nations. In other words, we have been like those little eaglets, quite satisfied with the little nest of this world of ours, smug, satisfied, and self-complacent. We forgot that we had immortal souls. We forgot that our souls had wings and were destined for God and can carry us to heights above the earth. And because we forgot this destiny, God had a stir in this nest of America. To unearth us from our smug worldliness and to make us realize that we had another destiny, 
and to bring us possibly within the very edge into the edge of disaster before he would lift us up as an eagle bird does and carry us back again to the God for whom we were made. And that is indeed an apt figure of America. For America chose as its national symbol not the lion seeking whom it may devour, not the sly fox laying in wait for his prey, not the vulture flying above waiting for its carrion, but America in the full consciousness of what we were all supposed to be chose as its symbol the eagle flying upwards and onwards beyond the sky, up past the troubled gateways of the stars, across the margin of the world, beyond the hid battlements of eternity, up through that hour of darkness to the day of everlasting victory with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy heareth the prayers of sinners, pour forth we beseech thee all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. We pray in particular for the President, for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships, whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war. We pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us all after the troubles of this life into the haven of peace and reunite us all together forever. O oh, dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom. This concludes my series of broadcasts for this season. It shall be my honor to be with you again the first of the year, on January the 3rd, to be exact. Your response to the Holy Hour has been marvelous. In a small town in North Carolina, for example, where there was no church, 14 souls under the inspiration of a colored school teacher expressed a desire to come to the fullness of the faith of our Lord. We are going down there this summer, and with the gracious permission of Bishop McGinnis, preach a mission in that little town and start the first Catholic church in that community. Such things are very encouraging. For you must know that the Catholic hour has no other standard of success except to bring souls to our divine Lord. If these broadcasts of mine did nothing more than to bring but one soul in the United States to the feet of our blessed Savior, then they would have been eminently worthwhile. Please, please do not discontinue your daily holy hour. America is still at war, and we want America to be on God's side. It will be all right for the sheen to wear off, but don't let the holy hours wear out. And before I take leave of you, my blessing to each of you, to every Jew, and to every Protestant, and to every Catholic. I hope that you're closer to God just because you listened. And this personal note, it's a little secret. I am on relief. I come to you begging. The relief that I want is your prayers. Would you, whomsoever you be, be so kind as to breathe a little prayer for me occasionally, that I may be a good priest and bring souls to God? 
That is the only thing in the world that matters. You have been tuning into me. Now I want to tune into you. If you will drop me a note assuring me that you will contribute a prayer to my relief, I shall send you a letter of thanks. In the meantime, I shall meet you every day in the holy hour. Au revoir. May Almighty God bless you. May his divine Son extend to you the merits of his redemption. And may the Holy Spirit sanctify you. And may Our Lady protect you and watch over you and keep you safe. Bye now. Bye. God love you. Holy Spirit, come and guide us. It gives us great pleasure to announce that next Sunday at this time, the Reverend Robert Slavin of the Order of Preachers will open a series of six addresses in the Catholic Hour. His first address is entitled, Dedication to Courage. Your announcer is John Patrick Costello. The Catholic Hour has been presented by NBC in cooperation with the National Council of Catholic Men as a public service and came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Johnny Miller is standing on the northwest corner of Fifth and Main. Tonight he's reached the lowest point in his 21 years of life. He's hungry, he's dirty, he has four cents in his pocket, and in this whole city he hasn't one friend. He hesitates on the corner, looking east on Fifth, where the street stumbles down past all-night movies, third-rate bars, and 50-cent-a-night hotels. He turns and looks west. Fifth Street climbs a hill there, spangled on either side with lights that finally blaze together and soar into the tower of brilliance that is the Palace Hotel. Johnny Miller thinks how a year and a half ago he was living in the Palace Hotel, and before that he had his own room in his father's house in Millersburg, the largest house there, because his family had built up the town. Johnny Miller thinks now of his family, his mother, his brother Tom, and especially of his father. His father, the last time Johnny saw him. Well, but Johnny, when you finished college, I was going to make you a partner in the firm, just like your brother Tom. And I told you I want to get away from here, Dad. I want to be on my own. Here, everybody expects me to be like you or like Tom. Uh, I don't want to hold you back, Johnny, but you haven't had any training or experience. I'll never get the kind I want in Millersburg. You realize what your leaving will do to your mother? I'm sorry, Dad, but I've got my own life to lead. I hate to see you do it the hard way, Johnny. Well, I guess nothing I've said has changed you. All right? Now I'll give you your share of the estate. Set up a bank account for you in the city. And, uh... Dad, are you busy now? Yes, Tom, I am. Tom, I'm going in business for myself in the city. Dad's giving me my share of the estate. So you finally wore him down going in business. You could put all you know about business on a toothpick and still have room left over. When you come calling back here, don't expect any sympathy from me. You've always been against me. Oh, Johnny, do you realize that if you get yourself in a mess in the city, there won't be anybody to pull you out? You could crack up your whole life. I'll show Tom. I'll show everybody. <laughs> Johnny Miller looks up at the tower of the Palace Hotel where he stayed his first night in town and for too long after that. Down the block from the hotel is the Shadowland Bar where he met Ted Wilcox the afternoon of the second day. <laughs> Here, I was afraid it was going to be kind of hard getting acquainted. Well, it generally is, Johnny, but I'm funny. The minute I see a fellow, I know whether I like him or not. The minute I saw you, I said to myself... Now, there's a guy who's got a lot on the ball. He's going places. Well, thanks, Ted, but, gee, I'm just getting started. Yeah, that's the toughest part. 
Things in town are a little slow now. There are a few good deals, like the one Stanley Ferguson has. Well, I'm afraid that's closed tight now. I shouldn't have even mentioned it. Why not? Stanley doesn't want the word to get around, or everybody would be wanting to buy into this. It's an electronics deal. Red hot right now. Electronics? Well, that's just the kind of a thing I'd be interested in. Huh? Tell me what I'll do. I'll call up Ferguson and see if he's free tonight. We could meet him at the Manhattan Club. It's a real nice place. We can talk. Now, there just might be a chance if we move fast. Johnny, Ferguson liked you. Do you know you're in? Uh, the only calluses you'll ever get in your hands will be from clipping coupons. Oh, that's well. It was kind of hard talking business with a floor show going on, you know. Uh, I forgot you didn't know the Manhattan was a nightclub. Uh, who was that girl we met? She was awfully nice. Oh, uh, her name's Rosalie. She's engaged to some wealthy fellow. Oh. And he's out of town right now. Everybody who knows Rosalie hopes she'll break it off. Uh, this fellow's strictly a jerk. And if Rosalie got interested in some really nice guy... On the corner of Fifth and Main, Johnny Miller fingers the four cents in his pocket and looks up at his world of a year ago. Three blocks over from the Palace Hotel are the Coronado Apartments where Rosalie lived when she became Johnny Miller's girl in the days when he had money and a good time. That's how the money went, paying bills for Rosalie and having fun while he waited for Ferguson to start the coupons rolling in. He had so much fun, there wasn't time to look for a job or move to a less expensive hotel. Or worry about the stack of IOUs from the gang of good fellows who were always running into streaks of hard luck. Johnny Miller remembers the nightmare that began for him as he rattled the locked door of Stanley Ferguson's office, reading and not believing the sign that said, Close. The nightmare continued with Rosalie's frantic phone calls for more checks. With Ted's sorrowful shaking of the head at Johnny's mention of Ferguson. Oh, it just goes to show you, you can't trust anybody. Even if the police do find him, he won't produce your money, Johnny. But I've been depending on that deal of Ferguson's. Well, this couldn't have happened at a worse time. Ted, I... I got a favor to ask of you. It's not really for me, it's for Rosalie. Rosalie? Well, I was waiting for that deal of Ferguson's to pay off. That would have covered everything. Now... Johnny, I'd do anything in the world to help. If I hadn't just paid an installment on my furniture, well, they were backing up a van to haul it away. And if I hadn't just paid all this money... Johnny Miller remembers the pawn shop halfway down the hill from the Palace Hotel. The pawn shop that gave him Rosalie's money in the hotel bill and left him with the suit on his back and the shoes on his feet. He had enough change left for a drink at the Shadowland Bar where he heard Ted speak his name, but he listened unseen. <laughs> well, fellas, it looks like Johnny Miller's on the town. As Rosalie says, he lived it up for a year, and her time was worth something. <laughs> Barnum was right. There's one born every minute. <laughs> On the corner of Fifth and Main, a man in the streetcar loading zone is smoking a cigarette. He turns, flips away three-quarters of the smoke, it rolls almost to Johnny Miller's feet. He glances about to see if anyone's watching. Then he steps into the car. Hey, that car hit this man. Hey, mister, are you hurt? No. Oh. No, it just brushed me. Ah, just a skid row bump, scrounging for butts. I saw the whole thing. He stepped right out in front of that car after a cigarette. Just the bottom. Come on, kid. Let's get on the sidewalk. How about a cup of coffee? You look pretty shaky. No, thanks. I'm not looking for handouts. And I'm not offering any handouts. I want some coffee, and I don't like drinking by myself. Will you join me? Well, okay. Thanks. This place on the corner is all right. Yeah. I'll take this table. Sit down there. Uh, two coffees, Black. Where? You just speak a hard luck, haven't you? Yeah. You can't get a job because you haven't any decent clothes, and you can't get clothes without money, and you're too proud to take charity, right? I guess when I ran low, I should have taken any job. Yeah, but you waited. And now you're flat. 
Oh, here's your coffee. <laughs> Nothing like a cup of coffee on a chilly night. You from out of town? Yeah. You got a family back there? Yeah. Well, don't be a fool. Go on home. What? Well, I couldn't. I... I'll think of something. No, no, you won't think of nothing. You'll go east on Fifth, you'll land on Skid Row, and you'll end up telling lies to old ladies at church doors to get the price of a pint of wine. How do you know so much about it? <laughs> experience. Five years of experience. That's why I keep on the lookout for fellows who might take a chance to come back. Yep, I'll be glad to help you with the train fare home. No. No, if I wanted... To go, I'd do it by myself. Now, you take it from one who knows. Now, you think it over. I have to leave now, but I'll buy you another cup of coffee. Johnny Miller sits alone at the cafe table. He sips the coffee a stranger has bought him, and he tries to think. Go home. It's easy for him to say he doesn't know what it would be like. Going home, a failure. I couldn't face Dad after what I said. I couldn't have him see me this way. But what else can I do? The man was right. I'll end up on Skid Row. I ought to face it. I, I ought to take my medicine. But maybe they wouldn't want me. Dad shouldn't even want me. But he's the only one who might. Maybe Dad could forgive me. But Tom... I couldn't face Tom. I, I just couldn't take what he'd say. If I could just tell Dad I was sorry... That he was right, and I'm sorry. But... Tom and the other people, they'd laugh at me, I... No, I can't face it. They'd laugh. Oh, God, God, please. Hey, knock it off, punk. You're not going on a client jag in my place. Look, I'm not drunk. Go on, get out of here. All right. Uh, now look what you did. Coffee all over my clean floor. Not drunk. Or you can't even stand up, you wino. Here, take this rag and mop up that mess. Go on, get down there. Clean it up. Johnny Miller on his knees wipes the floor. People look down at him, some with pity, others with a sneer. Johnny Miller feels something inside him break. It crumbles. A shattered wall of pride. good it is to see you. Dad, I'm not asking you to take me back. I, I don't deserve it. Oh, I thank God you're home. But we didn't hear. We... Well, never mind. The money, Dad, it's all gone. And the things I've done... Johnny, I... forget it. Don't think about it again. You're starting over. But Tom, what'll Tom say? You know, he was... He was right. I came crawling. What difference does it make what Tom says? You were man enough to come back. That's all that counts. You had to learn from experience. But you paid for it. You're still his brother and my son. Johnny thought I'd lost my boy. You came back. The story of Johnny Miller sounds like a strictly modern one because it happens to so many young men today. Actually, this is one of the oldest stories ever written. Our Lord himself told it in the parable of the prodigal son. 
He told it to convince us that we have the most loving of fathers in heaven. The kindness of the human parent is only the dimmest shadow of the mercy of God. No matter how foolish we've been, how blackly we've sinned, we can always go back to our father and say, I'm sorry. And he will receive us gladly as his child. And all heaven is filled with rejoicing at our return. the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statute forever in your generation. <laughs> Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light. This public service program comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today we are honored to present the first of three programs based on the Joseph books by Thomas Mann, considered one of the great literary works of our time. Our first program introduces us to Young Joseph. The novels were adapted for radio by Arthur Aaron, and Paul Mann is featured as Joseph. God created man last, partly for the humbling of man, that he must needs say to himself, the blowfly was born before me, but partly that he might sit down straightway to the meal as the guest for whom all things had been made ready. This, then, is the tale of the dreamer of the young Joseph, the guest for whom all things have been made ready. The story goes on to tell how Joseph, being 17 years old, lived with his father and brothers in the shadow of the walls of Hebron. What is a man, it says, but a pattern of shapes and dimensions in the minds of others? And the shape and dimension of Joseph was firm in the mind of Eliezer, the scribe. Hail to thee, son of the lovely one. Thy progress is brilliant. Soon thou wilt be master of a prince and the admonisher of some great king. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Joseph, the youngest but one of twelve, would swagger out into the milking field to help... No, I, I must be honest to advise his brothers on how best to do the thing they had been doing all their lives. And the shape of Joseph, the dreamer, was firm in the minds of his brothers. Look, here he comes, the inky-fingered fool. Perhaps now he will graciously consent to touch a goat, pointing out its favors and blemishes. Oh, lay it only in our hands that someday, someday when our father is not there to protect him... <laughs> evening. The stars hang full in the black sky, and the lamps in the tent are lighted. Jacob the father sits with his son Joseph, playing at a game on the bronze surface of the tabaret. There, and there, and there. <laughs> now what? 
Now have I nothing left. Thou hast beaten me, Father. So it is. And yet I made many blunders. My father was distracted. True. Thy way of playing, Joseph, reminds me of Rachel, thy mother. Even her way of biting her little finger, as she considered, and certain little stratagems she loved. Thou hast them all, and I am moved by them as I play. Wert thou distracted, father, by something else? A promise, perhaps? Promise? What promise? A promise of thine that itcheth in mine ear by day and night. A promise which hath robbed me of peace, so that curiosity plagueth me wherever I go. Thy words add up, but their meaning... Didst thou not say only yesterday, Joseph, I purpose to give thee something to make thy heart rejoice. I said that? I... It was nothing. Nothing at all. Perhaps. But methinks I saw, as my father spoke, there was a thing in his mind's eye. Not just anything at all, but some particular and splendid thing. For me. Very well. I will tell thee. There was a thing. Was? Is. Oh. Hearken, my son. Hast thou ever heard of Rachel's Ketonet Basim? The coat of my mother? Something she wore? Listen now, and I will say it. When I had served seven years for Rachel, and the time approached that I should receive her in the Lord, Laban, her father, spoke to me. Jacob, I will give thee a cloth wherein the bride may veil herself and be consecrated. A fine thing, belonging once to a king's daughter, embroidered with emblems and portents. Rachel shall veil her head in it and become like unto the bride of heaven in the tower of Ebenezer. Those were his words, my son. But later, when I handed the bride the flower and lifted the veil, it was not Rachel, but Leah whom that devil Laban had brought to me. And did my mother wear this veil too at her time? She did. And it is not a veil, nor a wrap, nor a coat, but a piece of sumptuousness. Uh, is it... is it here, in this tent? Not far off. And my father will give it to me? Perhaps. Things are in the balance, and the Lord hath not yet pronounced upon them in my heart. What things, father? Art thou the firstborn? No. First came Reuben. But Reuben sinned, and I was driven to take from him his birthright. Is it thy turn next, then, that I should give thee the cloak? One might answer, no. For after Reuben came Simeon and Levi, and then Judah. And then again, one might answer, yes. Because when Leah's firstborn fell and was cursed, then came the turn of Rachel's firstborn, thou. But all that is doubtful and unclear. And if I guard thee in the cloak, then might the brethren falsely interpret it as the blessing and rise up in jealousy against thee and me. Father, let me see the cloak. Well, seeing is not having, but I warn thee, seeing is wanting to have. I must see it, Father. Very well. But stop where thou art. Put thy hands behind thee. Here in this chest it is. Not on top with the woolen, but down. Down to here. Here is the cloak of many colors. Ye heavenly light. How beautiful. Look, there is a man with a club fighting a lion. And there is a bat, a wolf, a bright colored bird. Ye heavenly host, my eyes are burning from staring at such a distance. I will come nearer. Not too near. What flowers. What figures and shapes and arrangements. Is the stiff of the fingers are soft? Let me touch it, Father. Well, it's... Oh, it is soft. I knew it. Is it too small, perhaps, or too large? How will I know? I must know. I must try it on just once. Just once, and only for a brief moment. Father. I have put on my coat. Shall I take it off? No. No. Keep it. Keep it. 
And Joseph wore the coat, and when he went to sleep, he took it off and covered himself with it. And later, when the brothers came in from the field, they looked down and saw. And Gad said, Look at him. Regard the sanctimonious expression. Here we stand, the workers in the fields, the milkers, the men of toil. And there he sleeps, the do-nothing, the turner of heads. And he hath the coat. Are we to bow down before him? I keep hearing those words, bow down, as though some cursed insect kept them buzzing in my ear. Bow down, it says. That's what he would of you. Bow down, bow down, bow down. Next morning, there was no conversation among the eleven brothers until they had separated the ten and the one. And the one, who was Joseph, strolled to the women's quarters to see his brother, the baby Benjamin. And as he strolled, he knew that he was being followed. Joseph! Joseph! It is Reuben! Wait! Good morning, brother. Good morning. I see thou hast a new robe. Wilt thou keep it? I will keep it, Reuben. Our father gave it to me as a gift. Last night, after the game we played. Joseph, thou playest these games shrewdly and well, for thou art practiced by Eliezer. Tell me, Joseph, didst thou let the old man win in order to ingratiate thyself? My answer. So thou hast wheedled the coat out of him. He promised it without my asking. And when I reminded him of the promise, he gave it to me. Listen, brother, knowest thou not it is against God to misuse the power that is given thee? What power have I over Jacob? Thou liest in asking, for thou hast over him Rachel's power. Brother, have I not saved thee ten times already from the wrath of the brethren? And for that, wouldst thou go and beguile our father of the coat while we were pasturing far away? Tell me who thou art, and how much is thine arrogance that thou makest thyself different from us all, and walkest as one set apart? Fearest thou not that thy conceit will draw down upon thee the dark clouds out of which the lightning strikes? Give it back, Joseph. Give back the coat. And at the evening meal, the brothers sat with faces like graven images. And Jacob was full of fears. But Joseph wore the coat. And one day at the harvest time, it came to pass that Joseph was in the field working with his brothers. And at the midday hour, when they gathered to rest and eat, Joseph fell asleep. The brothers continued their talk of this and that, and suddenly Joseph sat up. There was a strange look in his eyes as he said, I have had a dream. So, what is that to us? Brothers, would you like to hear my dream? No. Now, as I was saying... Forgive me, brothers, but I feel drawn to tell you of this dream. It's not a long one. What aileth thee, boy, that thou dost trouble us with matters that concern us not? Oh, but they do. This dream concerns you all, for you all come into it. Tell it, then, and be brief. I thank the answer. A few words and it's done. But first, hear me. The meaning lies with you, for it is known that the dreamer shall not interpret his own dream. If any of you dream and ask me, I will tell him the meaning, for the Lord has given me that power. But with my own dream, it is different. <laughs> Just call that a few words. Listen, then. And you will hear... Wait. Let him tell it, Reuben. I have done with it. No. Joseph, I know not thy dream. But meseemeth it were safer that each man be alone with his dream, and thou shouldst keep thy dream to thyself, that we all may go back to work. But we were at work in the dream, I mean. I saw us all together... The sons of Jacob harvesting the grain. Marvelous. Very interesting. Proceed, brother. We labored together without speech and bound the sheaves after cutting the stalk. Now, that is a great dream before the Lord. Knowest thou not, idiot, we should have bound first and cut afterwards? Ah, wait. For now comes the marvel. Each of us was binding a sheaf, and we were twelve. But Benjamin, too, was with us and bound his little sheaf with you in a circle. What does thou mean with you in a circle? Was thou not in it, too? No, Judah, I was not. Ye were in the circle, the eleven, but I stood in the center and bound my sheep. I advise thee not to continue, Joseph. No, Reuben, let him. I would hear the ending. So say we all. Well, then, 
When we had bound our sheaves, each one his own, we left them and went away. But we had gone only twenty paces when Reuben, yes, Reuben, it was thou, turned to look back. Then we all turned, and behold, my upright. Is that all? Yes. After that, I wait. And the brothers, who liked not the meaning of this dream, took counsel, and Simeon said, ah, It is simple. He is a liar. You mean it was a made-up thing conceived in vanity? I do. There is another possibility. What if the dream came from God? What thinkest thou, Reuben? I'm sure if this dream came from God, there is but one thing to do. Fall on our knees and pray. Joseph? To our dear little brother? No, to God. But it is my belief it is nothing but a conceit, as Simeon said. And the penalty? A beating, nothing more. Brothers, my memory is faulty. Did he say, bow down? Yes. No. Asher is right, he did not say bow down. Yes. No. Asher is right, he did not say bow down. What he said was, make obeisance. I am positive, Gap. Make obeisance, eh? Well, it's just as bad either way. No. To make obeisance is not quite so much as to bow down. Is it not so, Asher? True. One might make obeisance out of uh, caution and shrewdness. On the other hand, one might bow down and yet be too proud to make obeisance. Enough. We argue like magpies. It is decided that to bow down is the worst. Understood, Judah? Understood, my brother. But one thing. Let him tell another dream. And let him once use the word bow down. And then by the holy of holies I will... So it was with the brothers. And Joseph? Joseph went on dreaming. But there was that in the eyes of the others which kept him silent. And then it came about that Jacob paid a visit. He came to the harvest field and sat under the awning and smiled at his sons as the good ripe grain was gathered. And Jacob said, It is good that all goes well. It is especially pleasing that all my sons have come together in the Lord. Is it not? Well, Reuben? Uh, yes, father. Well, Gad? Yes, Father. Judah? It is pleasing, Father. Come now. When I was a young man, we told stories at the rest hour. We sang, and there were poems read and games. Is it that times have changed so much? Well, Joseph. I have no story, Father. What? No story from Joseph, the student, the reader? No, Father. There is, however, a dream. Joseph! Yes, Reuben? I think perhaps it would be better if thou didst not tell that dream. Oh, but this is another one. I dreamed it last night on the threshing floor. Just the same. Um, I would hear Joseph's dream. Speak up, my son. Very well. I dreamed... Speak up loudly, Joseph. We all may hear. I dreamed... And I saw in my dream this. This is what I saw. I saw the sun and the moon and the eleven kohadim waiting upon me. They came and they bowed down before me. The sun and the moon, Jacob and Rachel, and the eleven brothers. What a thing to dream. And Jacob was angry, and he spoke to Joseph, chiding him, bidding him hold his tongue. As for the brothers, hardly was Jacob gone, and they flung themselves as one man into the open. They shrieked and tore the air with curses. And then they sat themselves down in council. That night, they came before Jacob, and Reuben, the firstborn, spoke. Father, we are going away. All ten. And Jacob bowed his head. And then it happened that Jacob sent for Joseph to come into his tent. And Jacob said, Joseph, my son, thou knowest thy brothers are gazing the sheep in the vale of Shechem? Yes, father. I know not how things are going there. How went the summer lambing? Are thy brothers in health? It has given me much to think, and so 
I am resolved to send thee to greet them from me. I am here, Father. Thou wilt inquire of them concerning all that of which I am ignorant, and return to me with God's help in ten or nine days. What will I do? I will make a journey across the land. I will visit the brothers... Look after things, my Thou dost not go to look after things. Thy brethren are men enough and need not a child. Uh, perhaps they will return with thee? This I guarantee. And I say further, I come not back without them. Thus it was that Joseph arrived in the Vale of Shechem. And when the brothers saw him in his coat of many colors, they stared. Hardly had he time to open his mouth when there arose and swelled a thunderous roar as from tortured gullets, an exultant yell of rage and hate and sudden release, and the old ten sprang up as one man and flung themselves upon him. They beat him, coat and all. And when they had beaten him enough, they bound him and flung him into a pit. And then, breathing again, they sat down. Well, it is done. What now? We must kill him. No. Reuben. Art thou with us or against us? He need not be killed. He must. To stop now is to leave it at the halfway. And what is wrong with that? He is punished enough. No, brother. The halfway makes us guilty. Jacob's wrath is a terrible thing. Dost thou remember Bilhar, Reuben? I remember. Brothers, my name is Dan, but I am also called the serpent. And not without reason. This will we do. We will leave him in the pit as good as dead, and then... Brother! Brother! We must be quiet. He lies close at hand and heareth every word. It's all the more reason for his death. Reuben! Reuben, where art thou? Save me! I were saying then. Brothers, it is not for nothing that I am called the serpent. Dispense with the preliminaries. Hast thou a plan? I have. We shall take an animal of the flock and cut its throat. And in this blood we will dip the coat of many colors. Bring we it before Jacob and say to him, This have we found on the ground. Is it not thy son's garment? Brother, save me! Quietly, he can hear. The dead cannot speak. Let him hear. Brothers, do not tap with the blood in the coat. I beg not for myself. Do with me as you will. But spare our father. Do not bring him the bloody coat. It would kill him. Reuben, canst thou hear? Kill not our father. Reuben. Brothers, I am Reuben, the firstborn. And I say unto you, we will do what we will do. But this I know. We must move away from this accursed spot. Away where the sound of his voice will not reach me. Thus it happened that the brothers moved away. And Joseph was left alone in the pit. And as the brothers argued, it happened that a caravan of traders, Ishmaelites, came upon the pit. And they heard the cries of Joseph and they rescued him. And even as they approached, the brothers left off arguing. Into their heads had come the same suggestion. They would sell Joseph to the Ishmaelite. And this they did. Brothers, this is the oath which we will swear, each and separately. I will not tell, nor mention, nor divulge, nor indicate, not by sign or inflection, nor by flicker of my eyelash, what hath happened here and what we did with the dreamer. As for him who betrays this oath, we, the remainder, shall drive him from land to land, from river to river. He shall not know where to lay his head. He shall have neither life nor death, but both. The life and death shall spit him to one another his whole life long. And the brothers swore it. And then two beggars were found who brought to Jacob the blood-stiffened rags that were Joseph's coat. And Jacob, seeing this, tore at his clothes and rent them. And Jacob said, It is too much. First the mother you, and now the lamb. Wailing arise above the beloved sun, over the young shoot whose roots were torn out, over my hopes that are rooted out like to a sapling. Oh, alas, my child. Bread will I not eat. Water will I not drink. For Joseph, my son, is rent. Is rent in peace. Thus Jacob wept for the dead. And Joseph, the dead which was not dead, 
journeyed with the Ishmaelites into the land of Egypt. We take pleasure in presenting now on the Eternal Light Dr. Ludwig Lewison, novelist and critic, and editor of the New Palestine. Dr. Lewison. The tragic catastrophe which has come upon mankind, and which we pray is now drawing to a close, was foreshadowed on that September 14, 1930, on which the Nationalist Socialists won their first triumph at the polls. Thomas Mann had been invited to read from a new novel he was writing in Berlin. Instead, he delivered an address of warning to his fellow Germans and called it an appeal to reason. The new novel was Joseph and his brother. Was it what is now known as escapism that urged him on to its composition? Far from it. In these antique tales, in their inner meaning, Thomas Mann found the meanings that mean humanity to him. He had long been convinced that what ailed civilization was the split between nature and spirit. And it was this saving idea which he found to be the central idea of Israel and of Israel's history and faith. He found that idea embodied in Abraham, who was to be blessing and destiny to all people. He found it embodied in Jacob. He found it in Joseph. He found finally and above all that the eternal was consecrated within the congregation of Israel as he could be some day within the congregation of mankind itself if all life were to be lived as Jews are bidden to live it unto the eternal. This is, of course, a poor and thin description of the ideas which impel Thomas Mann to retell the story of Joseph and his brother. Yet, though he is first of all a great artist, and a great weaver of tales that is the sober truth that his choice of this subject and his long devotion to it arose from his finding in these immemorial stories the way of human redemption as he himself conceived it. It is also significant that in this age of the immeasurable crime of the Germans against the Jewish people, the greatest German artist in Goethe should have built this majestic monument of German prose upon a Jewish story told on Jewish assumptions drawn from the inner recesses of the Jewish spirit, summing up what Jews had dreamed and thought concerning this matter through the ages. We cannot speak of an act of reparation. Art is not in that sense self-conscious, but we can speak of a great symbolic gesture by which the stricken moral balance of the world is a little right. Thank you, Dr. Lewison. The Eternal Light has presented the first of three programs based on the famous Joseph books by Thomas Mann, adopted for radio by Arthur Arendt. Today's program, Dealing with Young Joseph, will be followed next week by Joseph in Egypt. The third of the programs, two weeks from today, will be on Joseph the Provider. Music for today's program was composed by Morris Mamorsky and conducted by Milton Caton. Cantor Robert H. Siegel of the Beacon Street Temple, Brookline, Massachusetts, was the soloist. Paul Mann was featured as Joseph... Alexander Scorby was the narrator. The entire production was under the direction of Frank Pat. The Eternal Life has come to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and is presented as a public service of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations. <laughs>